So if you really want to get to know a person, the best thing or the best place for you to start is at birth. <laughs> and, but if that is impossible, do a little research on their childhood. The person on my right, your left, the one that looks a little young, that's me. Still looking pretty good, right? <laughs> I am hovering over one of my most favorite people, my grandmother. I refer to her often because she, to me, embodied the word love. It was unconditional. It was embracing. She forgave me for many mistakes. She didn't even stay mad at me when, and I have a difficult first name for some people to grasp when I would correct her, and I boldly say, and I'm ashamed of this now, I boldly said to her, I'm not going to answer you unless you pronounce my name right. <laughs> Pretty bold, huh? <laughs> Guess what, within hours she pronounced my first name right. <laughs> but the story just begins there. Because one day, not far from this chair, I was looking over my mother's shoulder, and she was reading a letter, a letter written to her by her mother and my grandmother. And as a young person, you know, about eight or 10, getting to know syntax, and I didn't even know what syntax was, I'm just pretending, um, you know, getting to know words, structures, sentences, and the like, I looked at this letter, and I was puzzled because the woman who I looked up to the most, outside of my mother, please don't tell her, I just said that, but this person that I really looked up to penned a letter that had a number of misspelled words, run-on sentences, capitalizations that were not necessarily in the right place, and I was surprised. Because my grandmother, to me, was one of the smartest people on the planet. And I asked my mother why. Why am I seeing this? I would learn and be told a story about an unincorporated town in South Carolina that embraced Plessy to the fullest. It did not offer a high school education if you were a Negro before World War I, not only did it not offer an option for my grandmother, it spent $1.86 for every $15 that was spent to educate a white person in South Carolina. So this incredible woman, her opportunities stopped at grade six. She would repeat it two more times until a teacher told her, go home, there's nothing more we could do. What do you think that that meant for the rest of us and those similarly situated? Their opportunities were frozen in time. But what if in 1912, there was a platform that allowed for endless possibilities they did not see color, they did not see zip code, they did not see gender, but only endless possibilities. Well, today, thankfully, that exists. And it's called broadband. And broadband is the gateway to the internet. And the internet is the gateway to endless possibilities. For me, and this is a bold statement, the internet is the most enabling, most empowering, most open platform of our times because it meets us where we are. It does not pass judgment. It embraces you and transports you to a place, to a time, to opportunities that man, geography, and other types of limitations would never do. There is no place from where I sit today as I get a little older where this is more evident than the field of healthcare. Because you see, 
the least connected counties in this nation have the highest rate of chronic disease. Rural areas, rural counties in the states, in this nation, tribal communities, they are 10 times more likely to have low broadband penetration than their urban counterparts. And that, to me, is a lasting negative legacy, a limitation, not looking through a current lens, not so much unlike the limitation in which my grandmother experienced. Obesity presence in these disconnected counties 25% higher than in urban areas. And the diabetes prevalence in these rural communities is through the roof, 41% higher. This is unacceptable in 2018. In the most powerful country in the world, in a lot of cases, the most connected country in the world, we have these incredible disparities. And that is a shame. Now, I would admit to you that the federal government has done a lot of things to address these issues. It produced a national broadband plan back in 2010, which identified these possibilities and the tools and the resources we needed to allocate to make things better. The FCC minimally allocates $4 billion per year, and Congress allocated about $6 billion dollars back in 2012 in order to address these disparities. But today, I'm ashamed to say to you that there are 24 million of your federal, citizen, federal fellow citizens that do not have access at home to terrestrial broadband. And if you were to look at your urban citizens their primary access, particularly if they're poor, is on the mobile broadband side. And if they have a cap limitations when it comes to mobility, then their access to the internet is incredibly limited. So what do we need, even though we've spent billions of dollars over the past decade to address this issue? We need a digital civil rights bill. And we need one now. Because a digital civil rights bill would not use politics or personalities to get in the way of investing in our communities. A digital civil rights bill will tell the FCC, you cannot mess with Lifeline, the only program that is designed to address affordability to those people who are living pay to check to paycheck or under a paycheck that they don't have the opportunity to be connected to the tools and services they need to thrive in the 21st century infrastructure. We would not be limited by an E-rate that is underfunded, that doesn't recognize that connecting schools and libraries, especially in underserved communities, and that that is important and is worth every single dime we spent. And we would not be satisfied with underfunding our rural health care program, because you've seen the stats, and those are just the surface stats. Because what that means, rural communities, those urban communities that are under-resourced, they're sicker, they're sicker, and are getting sicker by the day. We have the opportunity, through a digital civil rights bill, to say no to the repeal of net neutrality, because we know that access to the internet is not equal. We know that 50% of us who have and subscribe to internet at home only have one provider. And one, I know I majored in business and economics, but one, the last time I checked, does not a competitor infrastructure make. One is not a choice. One gives you no options. One is just one. And when you only have one, then you must settle. And settle, we should not. Now, this picture was taken 
in 1962. I was 21 days old. And I'm looking into this camera and looking into the future that I had no, gosh, I had no idea what was in store. But my grandmother did. My grandmother did, and she knew that what she didn't have, I should have. And every time I saw her, she would be uplifting, even if she could not help me with my homework. She gave me hope. She gave me opportunities. She gave me a glimpse into the future, which was brighter than the one she had. Now, I, through my current lens, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you because the power to make that future bright for the nearly four million pictures that would look like that this year, that in order to make that future brighter than it was for me, than it was for her, that we must demand from Congress a digital civil rights bill that would embrace, empower, and embolden the opportunities that a connected America makes, that it would use and leverage the technology that a connected America enables. I say to you that the time is now to demand more from policymakers, to demand more from regulators, to demand more from elected officials, because the only way to get rid of the negative vestiges of Plessy and other limiting laws and policies is to create an equal playing field that only a targeted, intentional law would provide. Thank you very much.